Take your time, Wayne. Okay. <laughs> hey, good afternoon, everybody. Very warm well welcome to uh, well, my presentation about the, uh, building an Ansible AAP cluster. Uh, because there is, well, some things in there that you need to be aware of, because it's, it sounds easier than it is, but it's not as hard as you think. <laughs> well, yeah, well, that's what, what, what I ran into. Once you've got to know where the, the nags are, then you, well, really quickly get it up and running, once you know where it is. Uh, first of all, who am I? Well, my name is Tom Kirsten. I work for a small company in the Netherlands called AT Computing. There are a lot of colleagues of mine, and we are one of the sponsors of this event. Uh, and I do that since 2001 as a trainer and as a consultant, and I do all kinds of things with Ansible. Uh, I started using Ansible somewhere in the early days of 2012, somewhere in June or July, when Ansible was a couple of months old. And I did some patching, and I do all kinds of configuration management, and that's what, what my work is for, uh, predominantly. And I'm one of the co-organizers of the Ansible Meetup group, in the Benelux, so we are trying to persuade somebody in here to do an Ansible AAP demo, talk, whatever, uh, for our Ansible Benelux group, and well, let's hope that we succeed in that. Uh, one of the things that you, well, quite immediately run into, uh, what is Ansible AAP, the Ansible Automation Platform? Well, Red Hat has a very distinct description about it. Uh, Ansible automation platform if it elevates automation or whatever. Uh, the idea that I have is that Ansible uh, AAP is nothing, well, nothing more. It, it's predominantly a very nice interface around Ansible, which has uh, role-based access control and all kinds of handy things to make automation with Ansible easier than it is. Uh, are there any people who have never seen AAP? Well, a couple of you. Uh, there is an open source version of AAP called AWX, and I've uh, spun, up, spun up an AWX instance on the Google Cloud. This runs on a K3S Kubernetes uh, on a single host, so this is way easier than doing it in a cluster, of course. And I can log into this with my very secret password called Salami. I always have Salami, so why not? Uh, and what you see here, is that on the left hand side you've got a menu with all the options that are available to you. Uh, what uh, The number of hosts installed, uh, the number of failed hosts, well this doesn't run uh, all day long so that, well, it doesn't do anything, it's just for a demo purpose. Uh, and one of the things that you can do is that you can create all kinds of organizations. We've got two organizations in here, the organization Big Core and the organization default. The default organization is the demo organization that you get automatically when you install AWX. This is completely role-based uh, access control, so if you have multiple organizations, you can create users that are only allowed to see the stuff from one organization. You can have all kinds of credentials in here where you uh, connect to the HashiCorp fault, to the Google storage, everything that you can imagine. So this is the interface that you get. Uh, when you install Ansible AAP. The fact the interface is exactly the same, uh, but you don't have any support from Red Hat for that. You need the AAP, the official version by Red Hat. What you need to install an AAP is, in fact, nothing more than a license, of course, because it's the paid version uh, from Red Hat. And uh, you need a specific, well, not a specific, but a real Red Hat server. So it doesn't work on CentOS or on Rocky or on Alma Linux. So it needs to be a real Red Hat, so RHEL 8 or 9 currently, and then you can install, well, in fact, this interface. After you've done that, one of the things that you run into is that, uh, well, for my job as a consultant, a big corporation in the Netherlands asked me to uh, implement an AAP for them. Well, first of all, one of the things that always happens is that first comes a manager and he says, we want AAP. He has absolutely no clue what he was talking about, so I said, well, they're AAP. But then you talk to the tech guys, and they automatically say, no, 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 that's not what we want. What we want is to have something which is high available and concurrent, and that we can do everything with it, and we can switch one side off and one side, one side off. So, well, the second decision that you make is that they have two data centers. But they are completely separate, and there is more than 100 kilometers in between them. The only thing that they have is a good fiber 
uh, between them, uh, they even have distinct, and that's one of the biggest problems that we ran into, they have completely distinct networks in there. So the network on the left is a 192.168, on the right hand side is a 172.16. Uh, what they are doesn't really matter, but they don't route up, uh, among themselves, so that's what we ran into. Uh, well, maybe you, some of you spotted it, but what I did here is that I called the first one Balagherium. I'm always struggling to pronounce it, but that's Ansible version 1.0. And the other one is, come on everybody, that's Ansible version 2.14, the current Ansible version uh, that is running in AAP 2.3, the newest version of Ansible Automation Platform, just as a little gimmick in there. Uh, but if you have just two servers uh, in one of either uh, data center, one of the things that you run into is this is not a high available solution. Because if you switch one off, the other one keeps running, but the databases are not synced, so uh, the one node doesn't know what the other one is doing, so you need, to need, you need to do some extra stuff for that. So what we did, first of all, we started splitting up stuff, because with the Ansible Automation platform. The automation platform consists of a couple of components, and one of the components is the control node, which is nothing more than the web interface, in fact, and that web interface talks to the database. So you have the web interface, you have the execution node, that's where the Docker containers or the Podman containers run, where your Ansible playbooks are executed, <laughs> and there are a couple of other components in there. The automation hub, which is nothing more than your local Galaxy where you can store your own collections that you don't want to publicize on the internet, or your own containers where your own uh, collection and execution environments are in, and of course your database. And the database is in fact the biggest problem in the whole world, well in the whole high availability world, because the problem is if you have two PostgreSQLs, because PostgreSQLs SQ, PostgreSQL is what Ansible Automation Platform needs as an underlying database. If you have two PostgreSQL databases, there is no high availability among them. Because PostgreSQL doesn't uh, support something like master-master replication or, or schemes like that. So you need to do something extra for that. So what we did, in this case, there was a tool, uh, well the, there is a tool, and that tool is called EFM. Enterprise Failover Manager by Enterprise DB. And the corporation that I was working for, well, I'm working for now, uh, already had a license for EFM, so the discussion was quickly closed. We use EFM and just make it work. Well, after talking to consultants of the Enterprise Failover Manager company, uh, they said, well, what you could do is create a virtual IP between them. Uh, if you configure the Enterprise Failover Manager, these two nodes talk amongst each other and they decide who is the primary, master, primary database server and who is the secondary, the secondary database server because you can only store data into the primary database server and then they, uh, they sync amongst themselves so they make sure that everything is high available. But the problem that we had is when we create a virtual IP we have to take one either from that range or from that range. But as soon as we have a failover, the virtual IP moves to the other data center and it's not routable over there. Because it talk, in fact it doesn't exist there, you can't, you can't reach it. So we had to do some other extra bits in there and we were skimming through the documentation of the uh, Enterprise Failover Manager and then we detected, wait, there is something called PG Bouncer. I don't know if you know PG Bouncer, but PG Bouncer is an extra tool which does some extra, but well, specifically designed for web interfaces. And what it does is uh, it keeps track of all the queries that come in and only opens a single connection to the database so that you don't have to reconnect, reconnect, reconnect and reconnect again to the database because that's quite a costly action. So we, we could use that to do some nifty stuff. So what we did is we added a single bouncer node to each of the data centers and the bouncer node knows where the primary database is. Because this bouncer node, bouncer node 1, knows if the database is on the left hand side or on the right hand side. And that's the way that we configured it. Uh, on the 
database nodes, there is the enterprise failover manager running, and the enterprise failover manager keeps track of which of those two is the active node, and if one of the nodes failed, it automatically activates the other node and to make, makes that the primary, and then tells the bouncer nodes where the primary machine is located. And then comes the next problem, because, well, if you have one problem solved, it always, always is the next problem. The next problem is when you install the automation hub on a separate node, it automatically tells you that it needs shared storage between all the automation hubs, because if you insert data in there, it should be available to all of the automation hubs. But you don't normally have shared storage, and you can't use NFS, because if you use NFS, you have an IP address, and that IP address lives either over there or lives over here, so that problem still exists. So what we tried, we tried to use Gloucester FS. But then the second problem came, because Gloucester FS is not available for free on a Red Hat system. And the corporation immediately said, we don't want, uh, want to have any CentOS or Rocky or, well, name all the free versions of Red Hat. We want to have the supported version of Red Hat, so real rather. And the only thing we wanted to do was share a single directory. And it would be quite expensive to create a complete cluster FS system for that. And after long deliberation, we took well, one of the toughest decisions that we had to do, because we went to the guys of the Windows storage systems, and we asked them, do you have a share for us? Well, they had, they had, luckily, they had a, a, well, a lot of NetApps which were configured high available already for the Windows environment and for the VMware environment. So we borrowed, a store, store number one, and that's a high available data store that we use for the auto hub so that they can share their data among themselves. <coughs> what we finally did is that on the top of it, over all the data centers, there are a big IP net, uh, a big IP F5, all those kinds of load balancers and stuff like that that I absolutely don't know anything about. But there were a couple of guys that really, really know their stuff. And what they said is, well, on the, we always connect to something like HTTP 8.nzlab.nl or uh, bigcorp.com or whatever. Uh, so we connect to 8, we connect to 8, uh, H8 for auto hub, and we connect to B and the bouncer node. So we connect to the bouncer node for the databases, and that bouncer node moves us to the database where we need to be. And we connect on port 6432 to make sure that we don't get any conflicts with the normal 5432 Postgres database port. Uh, and we opened up all the uh, well SSH for all the machines so that they communicate among each other. And port 7800 for the, uh, uh, for the uh, enterprise failover manager for that communication. And we made sure that all the databases were in place so that everything can communicate. And then we need to do some sm well, small configuration stuff. It, it, w w once you know where you have to put stuff, it's not that hard, but well, first you have to figure that out. Uh, the Postgres configuration normally well, listens only on localhost, which sounds logical, uh, but it needs to listen to all the uh, automation hubs, controller nodes, and everything else. So what we did, well, we just opened it up for the world, and after we talked to the guys of the Postgres uh, stuff, they said, well, there's no problem in there, because the Access control in Postgres is quite good, so you don't have to worry about that. Well, we blocked it off with firewalls and everything else, so there wasn't any problem. Because it's, uh, the databases are already in a high secure segment of the network, which is completely surrounded by firewalls, so we didn't care too much about the Postgres security. Uh, and then we need to configure in Postgres, in the pghba.conf, we need to configure which machines are allowed with which users on which databases. So this is, uh, well, the, the, the configuration which AWX, the user AWX can access the database AWX, which is the database for the control nodes, uh, from those two machines. Well, the same goes for the auto hub. And these four at the bottom here are specifically the, for the replication. So the uh, replication between the database servers and the bottom one, the cluster check DB, is specifically for the enterprise failover manager that does stuff in the database to check if the databases are up and running. 
but we also need to tell it which machines are part of the cluster. So there is a file called efn.node where you can specify all the nodes. That's not really necessary, but preferred, because if you don't specify that, the enterprise failover manager will keep scanning the network if somebody else comes by and t tells it to be part of the cluster. But if you specify these two nodes, uh, well, I did it on IP address, but it could be host name as well. But then it starts up way more quickly because it already knows which host should be available. And of course, you need to do some configuration what the password is for the cluster checker de de uh, database that it can check if everything is up and running. And more special, uh, no, nothing more special in that. On the bouncer node, you have to place some scripts. These scripts are available uh, on the Enterprise DB website. It, you just copy paste to make sure you have the, the, the correct right, file rights, uh, file modes, so that everything can run. Uh, one of the things that you need to do is that the database nodes must be able to log in with SSH without a password into the bouncer nodes to change this file because this file contains where currently the primary database lives. So if the enterprise failover manager detects that one of the lower databases is going down, it automatically, through those scripts, changes this IP address into the new primary node so that everything goes to the uh, correct database and is stored there. But you also need to have a user password list, so you have to know where all the databases are, that's one, and how to log into that. Well, there is a very long command for that and a very tricky thing to do that with the EFM uh, tools to do that. Uh, but there's also a PSQL command, which is, well, almost two pages below the first command, and if you keep reading, then it says, well, if you run that command, you've got a complete file, just copy-paste it and put it in the file userList.txt, and then the output is something like that. And then we're almost done. Because what we need to do now is install the complete automation platform, because we haven't done that yet. The only thing we have now is a database up and running. So what we need to do is, well, create the rest. Uh, installing the Ansible automation platform is rather straightforward. There is an inventory file, you change the inventory file according the way that you want the complete environment to look at, and then you just run the setup command and wait. So what we have done here is we have told the uh, the setup command that we have two control nodes, AAP1, AAP2. We have two execution nodes, EE1, EE2. We've got two auto hubs. And we don't do any database stuff because the database stuff is done on a way lower level, so we don't want the uh, Ansible setup phase. To, to change our database. So we already created the AWX database with the user and the password, uh, the one for the automation hub, so everything for the databases is up and running. So we don't want the setup tool to change anything in the databases because we already fixed that. And then uh, some extra variables so that we can connect to the machine so that we can set up admin password for all the machines. Uh, and normally you would do some LDAP settings in here. If you have an LDAP setting, an LDAP server somewhere, you can change, you can set it up here as well. Uh, but don't do that for the automation hub, at least not if you're using LDAP S, because that breaks. I told some people from Red Hat how we fixed it, and they are looking into that. Uh, but currently, that for the auto, for the uh, the controller it works, but for the automation hub there is something not 100% correct yet. Uh, but it won't take, I, I see that Greg is laughing, so that won't take long anymore, no, probably. So that will be fixed. Uh, well, these are all the settings that you can, you can well, what, what I have done uh, for that, uh, I, and as you can see, I always use the password salami, well, on these slides, not in real life, of course. Yeah, just only for demo purposes. And then, you wait. It takes about half an hour, three quarters of an hour, to get installed. And it goes to all the machines. One of the things, well, maybe I did forget to tell you, one of the things that you need to do is to make sure that you can reach all the machines from the, well, the machine where you run this on. I run this on controller node one. It doesn't really matter where you do that. 
but that you can arrange all the machines through SSH because the complete install process is under the hood done but with an Ansible playbook or multiple Ansible playbooks. Uh, so you have to be able to reach all those machines, that's one, and that you make sure that you have all the uh, SSH keys already imported in your SSH uh, store because otherwise during installation it will tell you, well, I'm trying to log into that, but in the meantime it does some installation further on, so you lose that, and then the one does, doesn't work, and then it breaks. So you just have to make sure that you have touched all the machines at least once, and preferably on IP address, on hosting, and on fully qualified domain name, so that you have everything that is in there. And once that's done, you have got an up and running Ansible automation cluster, and well, you see the difference with the AWX hat. Here you have a nice Red Hat logo. And some X, well, I think some extra features. I'm not still quite sure what, what the, the main difference is between those two. And if you have a look somewhere below what the, the complete topology is of your uh, complete cluster, it will tell you that you have a setup like that, two automation hubs and a couple of a controller and a couple of execution nodes. And I think I'll wait early, right? Well, then we have a longer break, I guess. <laughs> Uh, if you ever want to reach me about something, stuff like this, or uh, other kinds of uh, Ansible, well, just reach out. This is my email address somewhere, uh, uh, my mastodon. Well, I'm still on Twitter. I'm not quite sure how long I will be on Twitter, but I'm one of those guys who is still on Twitter. Yeah, and uh, well, I'm on, on IRC, and uh, specifically for my boss who is over there. If you want to join us, that's how you can reach us. Are there any questions? Yes? Yeah, I'm part of the product execution team of Ansible. I'm wondering what kind of feedback do you have you know, for the AAP installation flow as well? Is there anything that you, know, you, uh, you the, the, think that you know, would, could be better? Yeah, the question is for the, for the people at home. Uh, if there is any feedback for the installation process, well, I think personally think, well, uh, apart from the LDAP stuff, because that's just a, a bug that's in there that's going to be fixed. I think that the standard in standard installation for an AAP, not in a cluster but a single node, well that's quite straightforward. You fill in two or three, four or five uh, variables uh, and then you run setup and then it works. If you want to do a cluster setup, you do quite a lot of Googling. And then you end up, most of the time, well, at least I, I ended up on a video blog by Maxime van Haag, I don't know if you know that. Uh, Maxime Bubbenhout, sorry. Oh, yeah. yeah, that's an old yeah. uh, Red, Hat, uh, Red Hat guy, and he explained how to do it in Tower. Uh, well, if you can do it in Tower, chances are that it works for AAP as well. So I, I did that and I combined that with the documentation of the EFM. Yeah, but maybe should, Red Hat should write a, doc, a docu how, yeah. how to do it in a cluster, because that's something that I were, was really looking for and couldn't find. So that, that's the only, but, but I figure out how to do it, so it, it's still possible, but yeah. Yeah, it's good to play. Yeah. The uh, automation hub and control nodes are now VMs, correct? Correct. Uh, the automation hub and the control nodes are VMs, yes. And uh, also the execution environment is a VM, yes. Could this be done on Kubernetes OpenShift as well? Uh, yes, it's even now completely available on Google. Google Cloud, you mean? Yes. Okay. Yeah, in the marketplace and the AWS yeah. marketplace. Yeah, it's, it, it, since a couple of days, I believe. Yeah, it's available in the Google Marketplace. So you can just click it, click it, click. I want an AAP, and then it up, it's up and running. Oh. The same on AWS, by the way. You, you can go to my. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Multi Cloud. Yeah. And on Azure, you have on top of it, you have, you have like a managed service. So you can actually like, pay. You don't have the mic. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I can give you the mic. Sorry. That's fine. Yeah, so you have, right now you have Azimov Clouds on the three major providers, and on Azure you have on top of that, you have like a managed service, so you can actually pay Red Hat for managing a, a Antigo for you, basically. But well, that's, that's even... <laughs> so, um, I've been dipping my toes in trying to set up AAP as well. Which repositories did you use? Because I tried configuring a satellite first, 
adding repositories for A, and then trying to hook that up to the place book set that you get when you download the package. How did you do it? What I did is I downloaded the bundle. Question. Repeat question. Oh, no, sorry, the question. How, which repositories did I use to install it? Uh, well, I, there's no, well, there is a satellite involved in this. I have to be honest about that. But they have all the standard Red Hat repositories. And I downloaded the AAP bundle. And in the bundle, everything is in there. It's a download by about three gigabytes, I think, some, something around that range. And then you, well, you, you untar it, unzip it, and then edit everything in there. So then you have all the packages that you need. So in fact, you are almost completely offline. Okay. Yeah. And did you make provisions in uh, the environment there to update it from satellite repositories, or do you have to download new bundles in the future? Uh, in the, in, uh, if I do need, to, well, with an update. Uh, how do I do an update? Well, the way I do an update currently is that I download a new bundle, extract that next to the original one, copy over the inventory file, and just run set up because it's completely, well, almost idempotent. It only changes what needs to be changed, and everything, well, within the hour, everything is up and running again. Any more questions? Nothing from the chat room? Oh, thank you. Thanks, John.